Welcome to Roundtable Live. It is October 13th, 2017. My name's Bear Taffy. I'm joined by Mathis Games, Rockley Smile, Northern Lion. It's time for the show. Hello. Oh, boy. It's Friday the 13th. Sure is. Boys. Did you see? Spooky. I'm sure y'all did by this point. Did you see the flight that was, it was Friday the 13th, flight yep. 666 going to hell. That was the best thing I think I've ever seen nice. on Friday the 13th. I didn't 13th. see that. Traveling yeah, to Helsinki. the airport abbreviation H-E-L. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's great. <laughs> That's great. How would you like? That's could awesome. you could you go on that flight? I don't know if I could go on that flight. I don't know if I could bring yeah. myself to do it. Listen, every it. single one of my flights, I'm convinced I'm dying. So I'm <laughs> yeah. <just> like, <laughs> let me on. At that point, the Helsinki. I guess you're not you're not really going to be able to get out of a trip to Helsinki. That's that's something you probably committed to a long time ago. So yeah, I guess you just got to ride the wave there. Uh well. Anyway, we got a show for you today. We got a nice docket. IGN has acquired Humble Bundle. A big story coming just this morning, so we're going to talk about the implications there. Uh, lots of VR news. Oculus had its keynote over the uh, last week, I think, and they came out with a lot of big new information. Uh, exciting me in particular, actually. This is like the, the, the phase of the VR movement that I've been waiting for for a little while, so I'm excited to talk about these stories here. Uh, we are going to discuss a little bit more about the whole loot box situation. Uh, Peggy and the ESRB have both weighed in on the affair, stating their opinions, so we'll discuss uh, the new information they presented to us, as, long, or as well as some new games we're going to be talking about this week. Carried Away, kind of a uh, Polybridge-esque uh, ski resort simulator sort of deal. We'll talk about that one. Uh, the Scorn Alpha, which I think we actually talked about a little bit uh, maybe a few months ago on the show, but it looks like uh, they've got a little bit more going well i played game. it now well, yeah, now yeah, Matt does and well. i have played it mm -hmm. yeah uh space engineers which has been in beta early access for quite some time nick and i actually checked out a few hours worth of that this week so we'll talk about that and then the big new one today the evil within two uh, has yeah. just been released mathis and nick have played a bit of that and we'll talk about that today as well uh i do i do want to mention i've begun to get over it i think our entire squad at this point is getting over it with bennett foddy right I could say that I am officially over it at this point, oh. but I don't know how disingenuous I'm being by saying that because I managed to find the only way. I'm literally the first person, mm. according to the developer, that it's found a, a way game. to beat the game without actually beating it. it was I broke it at the very last second. I, I, I looped over the top of the tower and then fell back down in a way that couldn't save my save. Mm -hmm. So the only solution was to start from scratch again. I don't want to spoil it, and I'm sure you don't want to either, but man, it's just like, oh, we were watching you last night, and it, it was the most heartbreaking thing in the world. <laughs> People were saying in the chat, like, I think it's appropriate. This is probably like the true ending to getting over it with Bennett Foddy, right? Like, it's just yeah. an accurate representation of what life is all about. After all these arduous climbs and obstacles you never thought you could surmount, by the end of it all, well, fuck you anyway, really is what it boils down to. I hope... That game. If anything comes of this, that I get to be the footnote in the GDQ run where someone finishes the run and just goes, <laughs> little known fact, one person has actually screwed their save by falling down the whole tower with their <laughs> hammer no on the one other else side. Sins <laughs> because they learned their lesson from him. So that's why I hope he doesn't patch it out because I want to be able to stay relevant in that respect. Sure, yeah, that's fair. But I've technically finished it uh, now, I guess. That game, man, I hope the developer never watches me play it because I've said some horrible things about that developer <laughs> throughout that entire playthrough. Dude, I'm I'm realizing that I'm a very angry person as a result me of that too. game. I, like, <laughs> I try not to be, but oh, when I when I fall like two or three levels of progress down and I hear Bennett Foddy's voice start, I just want to punch him in the mouth right there, <laughs> man. Like, like, I get so angry. I call that game like and I don't mean it, like I ninety percent don't mean it, but I call it like the stupid man's the witness because it just mm. gives you like nonsensical quote unquote smart quotes. Oh yeah, yeah. While yeah. you fail miserably constantly. I don't know if he's trying to like, be it's like, like it's like Emily Dick it's like ninth grade literature quotes is like what he's throwing at you. Yeah. It's like and it it pisses me off. I don't know if he's trying to be like holier than thou about it i think he's more just intentionally trying to piss you off i think that was like the entire intention is yeah. oh hey dumbass no, by works. the way enjoy he this. literally said he wants to cause people pain yeah yep no nope, and he <laughs> does a good so, job 
I yep. tell him he's a terrible developer and he needs to go back to Unity school. I did. Uh, I, I managed to conquer Orange Hell, Nick. So I, I, I've ascended Already? the rung. Yeah, yeah. I, I, well, like I, I took, took the me lessons. took a fucking week, Bear. Well, like, see, the thing is, though, you guys have been doing all of the troubleshooting and yeah. stuff for me. You know, like I don't have to go through the process of learning how to do it. I just like know how and just have to execute. See, then you're spoiling point. it for yourself. Bear. A little bit. Yeah, it. yeah. A little bit. I it's haven't part watched. Of the process. I where I'm at right now and uh, is a uh, stairs with security camera. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the camera conundrum. That's, uh, that's where that's, I'm at. I've, I've called that death stairs. Death stairs is probably even okay. better. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've gotten to the security camera and I've been able to launch myself off of it. And I've gotten like to the part up there and then I've effed it up and fallen. Mm -hmm. Furniture hell. Yeah. Yeah. Despite getting to the end, I still can't beat orange hell consistently. It's really hard. It's to a build. fluke every time I get up it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Child slide scared the shit out of me the first time. I was like, there's a child! And I fell. And I, like, got it spooked me. Dude, I did. I got the fucking jump scare. I didn't see the jump scare the first time, but it, wow, that was way more than I expected it to be. Uh, but yeah, anyway, getting over it with Bennett Foddy. I'm, I'm, it's fun, actually, real quick. Like, am I alone in for, that? I know Nick obviously is doing it. Every day, it's fun for 10 minutes, and then my <laughs> wrist starts to hurt. Yeah. Yes. And then I'm like, this game sucks. <laughs> That's pretty much where I'm at is like, I, I just fall one too many times and I'm like, my hand is yeah. just tired. Yeah. Like, yeah. I, like the I way I have to like, contort my wrist and move, I'm like, oh, fuck this game. <laughs> what am I doing differently? I never get wrist fatigue and I play it for four oh, hours man. like every day. You're just in your zen, man. I guess that's all it is. You you've like you gotta, you gotta loosen your grip. You're gonna you're gonna hurt yourself. I can't help it though, man. Like you get so, I, when you were you feel like you're holding on to your, your that ledge for dear life with your yeah. fingers. Like well, that's there the are thing. also times where like I, I always say like seventy percent of the time I fail, it's my fault. But thirty this like thirty percent of the time where I'm like I swear I did not move my mouse that hard and my man just like <laughs> launched himself off of whatever he was or holding. for whatever like, reason you'll be going what am I doing you'll be going full circles right like all the way up and then all of a sudden he'll like cramp up like nah, I don't want to bend my arms anymore we just gotta <laughs> get my mouth tied up I constantly am messing with like the mouse sensitivity because I always feel like there's like mouse mouse acceleration or something going yeah, on on my mouse yeah. and I'm like why does it feel weird with with this game but like outside of the game my mouse feels normal but in this game it feels off. I well, and I don't know if it's on purpose. The cursor is a gesture, and then the animation follows the gesture is the thing. It's designed that way with a little bit of latency between the mouse input and the character movement, mm. uh, which allows you to be more precise, because if it mimicked every movement one-to-one, -one, you'd probably end up whacking the hammer off everything and bounce around. Yeah, yeah. I, wonder, I do wonder if trackpad would be easier. I keep seeing the option for trackpad sensitivity. I'm like, God, I wonder if that makes people, like life way easier. People were saying, to try it. yeah. All right. I want like a track ball for it. Yeah, you were talking That's about like, that too. Really? My dream is like one of those like 1995 mice. Mm -hmm. that yeah, yeah. The big, like big green ball. ball. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> like that. That perfect. sounds like it's awful. That sounds like it would be horrible. No, dude. Can you imagine? Like you want to get leverage, you can get that thing spinning at like you know 100 RPMs or something. <laughs> That's how you do the speed run <laughs> skips, dude. That's how they're getting you. Exactly. Your full body, both hands. <laughs> <laughs> The game, the game does lend itself really nicely to like self-named rules and techniques, though. Mm -hmm. I'm like, does I have like seven rules that I follow and like one solid technique. What's your solid technique? The high school technique. What's that? You just, you just stick it out and put it in whatever's willing to take it. <laughs> Okay, really glad I asked you to clarify that one. <laughs> That's the high school technique. The high school technique has saved me many of many a tragedy. I'm sure. <laughs> All right, <laughs> let's, let's talk into the docket. Uh, Humble Bundle has been acquired by IGN. IGN acquires the Humble Bundle. Just today, uh, Meaty John IGN announced has acquired Humble. Terms of the deal were not disclosed. Uh, however, a quote from uh, IGN Executive VP Mitch Galbraith uh, kind of gives us an insight into their plans. He says, quote, If it's not broken, don't fix it, said Galbraith, who explained that IGN started looking to make the deal like this nearly a year ago. The idea is to just feed them with the resources they need to keep doing what they're doing. We want to stick to the fundamentals in the short term. We don't want to disrupt anything we're doing already. Uh, oh, sorry, this is actually not him anymore. This is coming from, uh, this is Graham, one of the... Oh, co-founder of Humble, John Graham, says, We want to stick to the fundamentals. We don't want to disrupt anything we're doing right away because of the shared vision and overlap of our customer bases. There's going to be a lot of opportunities. So, face value here. Like it said, the terms of the deal have not been disclosed, so we can't dive into the nitty-gritty of everything going on. But 
Face value, it certainly seems like this is the, the best case scenario for an IGN Humble Bundle acquisition. Is that the, the vibe y'all are getting here? They just are not allowed to review any Humble games. Well, yeah, I guess okay. now, right? If yeah. streamers are not allowed to review any Chrono stuff, then I think that that's fair. <laughs> I agree. They or should. Humble games now at this point. No, no I, like, like, I mean, it's, it's, it, it's fine now. And maybe it'll be fine forever, and and maybe mm -hmm. it won't. But like, I don't know. I I do kind of think that we have to give them the opportunity to mess it up. Mm -hmm. uh, IGN is probably the outlet out there, besides Kotaku, maybe that people are the most cynical about. And I think part of that is deserved, and part of that is, in my opinion, kind of antiquated and based on the way that they used to do business like 15 years ago. Mm -hmm. But uh, well, maybe 10 years ago. But either way, um, I I mean, it's kind of. I, I mean, I don't know. Would you would you say it's troubling or an ethical breach? I, I don't think it is until they've actually done something that could constitute an ethical breach. Mm. Is it is it more of an ethical breach than the largest distribution platform on you know PC being owned by a company that also publishes and can promote its own games on that distribution platform? You know, I, I think if we're going to turn the lens on IGN before they do anything, we might as well turn it on, you know, Valve or turn on streamers and YouTubers who have affiliate links for humble stuff already in stuff that they're playing on their streams and on YouTube. So mm. I, I, I kind of default to the idea that even though people are cynical about uh, IGN in particular, you have to give them the opportunity to, to do something wrong before we can crucify them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'm, I'm pretty much in the same boat there. I was really surprised by this, honestly. I don't know if you all felt the same yeah. way, but this was totally out of left field for me. Like, I didn't even realize... Humble was the kind of thing, well, I mean, now that you think about it, obviously, they're, they're the kind of thing that can be acquired. But I didn't really think of them as, you know, like a, a commodity on the market right now. You know, like, they're, they're, as the small player, they're still entirely in control of everything. They've just been blooming and expanding at, at rapid paces over the course of the last seven years. It seemed like they were doing fine, but I guess they could be doing even better is the thing that they're looking at here. And IGN, obviously is a great source of lots and lots and lots and lots of money. And if that's what you need, then, well, there you go. You found it. So what's the trade-off then? Like, why would they sacrifice their independence? I, I, obviously, they seem to need a cash injection, but also they seem like they were doing well. Mm -hmm. So that's why you start to wonder about where where the deal might be off. Mm -hmm. But we don't know. Yeah. Yeah, and I, I think, like like Ryan said, like we got to give them the chance to fuck it up first before we begin to like paint them into a corner of what they're going to do. Yeah, but it's I, I mean I'm not really too worried about it at the same time, like especially just based on the statements they provided. Like it really seems like they they understand what they're doing here. They're not going to try to turn humble into some bastardized version of itself. They're not going to try to take the profit off the top wherever they can. It seems like they might just very well be leaving them to, to their own devices. And like Humble deserves that, I think, right right now. They, they have definitely proven that they uh, understand what they're doing. And they have basically only done good things since starting off as just the Humble Bundle. You know, like they've, they've turned that into so many more uh, different distribution models within their own platform like the monthly bundle the mo mobile bundle they've got their entire humble storefront now which is almost a direct competitor to steam like which is outlandish when you think about it compared to what they were seven years ago so but i mean are they actually <laughs> a competitor to steam they're they're technically a competitor to steam what, right? what percentage of games purchased on pc pass through humble at any point like more a lot more 0. Now than there used to be five percent maybe which is probably like a thousand percent increase from 2012 right sure but i the idea that they're like even knocking on the door i think is is a little outrageous sure yeah no i don't disagree but it's still like the fact that they've gone that far to be to create an entire storefront for themselves which has unique appeals in and of itself i mean like there's the entire overarching humble uh, caveat, which is that this is all contributing to charity, which is, you know, like a unique appeal for something of this nature in the games industry right now. So they've still got that going for them, too. Uh, but yeah, no, it's just a pretty interesting development overall. I, I am curious to see what, if anything, IGN will do with this acquisition or whether uh, Humble will just sort of stay the same with a big uh, J2 Global sticker on them now. But... We'll see. That's the, the parent company of IGN, by the way. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. Mm -hmm. It goes, man, that, 
I thought that ladder went a little higher, actually, but uh, J2 Global is where it stops. But that is a that is a company that loves their faxes, man. Hold on a second. Let me tell you all about J2 Global and their fax <laughs> presence. J2 Global owns uh, subsidiaries such as, oh, God, okay, I had it. I had it. I had it. There's so many. Where'd they go? Oh, God. Oh, here it is. You got MyFax, MetroFax, TrustFax, RapidFax, SendToFax, Fax.com. And that's it. But that's a lot. That's a they lot of car oh, fax. No, ca no car fax. They got e fax though. That's the one I was waiting for. If you're looking for fax services, J2 Global is your company. They have got you covered. Maybe that's why they're trying to diversify. Maybe that makes a little sense. All right. Anyway, yeah, that's humble bundle acquired <laughs> by IGN. Let's talk VR. Big news in the VR front today. First one, the Oculus Go announced. This is coming from the Oculus uh, keynote. This past week, the Oculus Go, uh, Zuckerberg claiming this to be that sweet spot between uh, mobile and computer VR. So you've got the things like the Gear VR right now, for example, that's like a hundred bucks. You plop your phone into it, you strap it over your head, and then it's just a phone really close to your face that emulates a VR experience. Uh, you got the standard computer VR right now, of course, which is, it's the V1 stuff, but it's still fairly impressive. And then you got the Oculus Go which is a standalone $200 built-in VR headset. No more hooking up to computers or phones, no more of that nonsense. You just got your own little $200 VR experience, good to go, Crunchwrap Supreme style. You know what amazes me about this is that the technology is now so ubiquitous that you can create something like that for that cheap. That's kind of amazing. Mm -hmm. No kidding, right? It's not that expensive for what that claims to do. Although we don't know exactly what it does claim to do. However, if it's a VR headset, it's got to give you VR. So Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> if it can deliver that, then yeah, sure, there it goes. No, I, I completely agree. Like this is, this is the thing that's by far the most exciting to me uh, of all the VR stuff that we're going to be talking about today is that these price points are just plummeting, man. Like they are dropping so quickly and it's so awesome because that, like we saw that just needs. from, what? That's just what it needs. Yeah, exactly. Needs. Like we saw that from the Rift sale. They even went so far as to say like sales of the Rift exploded during just that temporary point where they dropped the price by like 200 or $300. So th I really feel like we're seeing now that, yeah, there are people that want to get into it. They've just been waiting for this moment where it's accessible via price point. And $200 is great for standalone VR, too. I mean, like, even, even if it doesn't really meet the standards that we've set right now for computer VR, if it's a step above the mobile experience as a standalone kit that appears yeah. to be a lot more comfortable than any previous iteration that we've seen, that's a pretty good deal. Yeah, I'd be interested in taking a look at it. I'd, I'd like there to be a day where like, I can get on a f flight and be happily just disappear into VR for a while mm -hmm. and not vomit the entire time. Um, but uh, yeah, a, a mobile VR thing would be, I think, is a good idea. Uh, I'd, I'm, I'm curious. I, I'd get, like to get my hands on it at a convention or something if they bring it just to see what, what it's all about. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Do you sure. think it's just a bunch of like really old Android phones that they repurposed <laughs> into a VR headset? That was the lenses? prototype. That was the prototype. <laughs> Well, like, just, like, hardwired it and then sealed it up and then it's like, here you go. I, I almost don't understand how it's that cheap unless it's just not that cheap. I Like, there's multiple versions or something and we're getting a view of what would be the ground floor, but you also need to buy X, Y, and Z. There is, so I don't, I don't know enough about this to even speak at length, but I know that one of the big things is the type of screen that they're using within these headsets. So you got like LCD screens, LED screens, and then I think like OLED screens, which are going to require uh, different levels of uh, power, I suppose, to uh, operate them at their highest capacity. So again, I don't know enough about the differences there to really speak at, on it at yeah. length, but I, I, that is probably one of the factors at play. And then, yeah, I mean, like, I, I guess I just have to assume now one of two things, either A, the technology for creating this stuff has just gotten significantly cheaper over the past year or so, or B, they were just pricing it at that point to kind of like weed out folks that weren't really interested in it and play the uh, early adopters game, I guess, you know, like yeah, they can afford to do that because A, they need to offset the cost and then B, people will pay that price at this stage of the technology. You know what I mean? Like, 
obviously now you're not going to be able to put out an $800 VR headset because like, oh, fuck that. No, I can get it to go for 200 bucks, and that doesn't even require me plugging it yeah. in or anything. So this is... My, my sneaking suspicion is that it's probably like buying a netbook where, yeah, yeah. okay, it's like, I wanted a laptop, but I got a netbook. I can watch Netflix on this, but I cannot do much else. Mm -hmm. And they did mention watching streaming video on it. So maybe that's like literally what it is. Yeah, maybe. It, like it's, it says it's awesome for watching movies or concerts, playing games, or just hanging out with your friends in VR. Like, yeah. they're definitely not trying to market this thing as this is going to be able to play games at incredible resolution and give you those, you know, in, immersive, in-depth VR experiences. This definitely yeah. seems like it's being marketed as go, you know, like it's on the go. Like if you want to be able to very quickly do VR things with your friends or just like to pop on a VR headset and watch a movie in VR, if that's a thing people do, like, there you go. That's, this is the good option for it, but... It's not but really if that idea. is all it does, will that actually help the brand? Because mm -hmm. I kind of feel like it might hurt it more than help. Yeah, it's an interesting question. Like, I know, uh, I know 100% what the answer is to this question when I ask uh, this group, have you watched a movie in VR recently? And like, no, sorry. and I'll explain my concern. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Which is that if this is primarily like a, a VR machine, I, it just feels foreign for me to be like, hey, honey, I'm going to go sit on the couch and put my VR headset on and <laughs> pretend to watch a movie. Like, if you if you have other people around you, if VR is supposed to be like a social experience. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's almost like a little too black mirror for me, right. for us all to yeah, enter the digital saying. world together in physical space. Like... It, something about it freaks me out. So that, yeah, I understand that completely. But think about maybe like five years from now. Do you think it's a possibility that that'll be such a common thing where there'll be like $400 VR headsets on every coffee table where people can just pop those on as a family and dive into a film? I don't buy it. You don't buy I also, it? For, not only do I not buy it, but I'm like, maybe this makes me a snob, but it's not like they're filming the movie in VR. Why would I rather? Yeah, not yet. It? Why would I rather put myself into like a digital movie theater instead of just watching it on a screen that's like designed to be? Yeah, to, yeah, yeah. yeah. To show well, the only thing I can think of is like I'd rather watch a movie in my VR headset than use the three-inch airplane screen. So I agree with that a hundred percent. That's the only thing I can think of where maybe like that, and maybe if you don't live in the United States and public transportation is like your everyday thing outside of like you know new york or something like that mm, yeah i can see people throwing it on like a train or something but even then i'd be afraid someone's gonna so rob me blind yeah, yeah. I'm not gonna... <laughs> on, a, on a plane you're kind of like you're, you're safe you're in a safe environment yeah but yeah. like in public that's out of control yeah yeah and then I, I also am like at home like you know that's like family time so yeah. I, I if i lived alone i could definitely see it people are like it's gonna like porn porn is gonna push oh yeah it. i don't no, think porn so. yeah no, no, I don't. I don't buy it. You don't think so? I just don't buy it because like porn's not going to be enough to drive an entire generation of technology. Who in the entire ecosystem of our community has ever spent a single cent on any kind of <laughs> pornographic content? You're going to tell me that the average person is going to buy a two hundred dollar porn box? <laughs> it's like she's it. actually there, but I still can't feel it. They never I'll had the option to buy a two hundred dollar porn box before, so we don't know. What I will buy, though, is that in five years, augmented reality glasses could be a conceivable thing where mm. perhaps you just wear your glasses all the time, like, you know, the Google Glasses. Well, what the hell happened with the Google Google Glass? Well, they, yeah. got, they, they got canceled. They got canceled, but then they were secretly working on another prototype that never got released to the public, and they've been giving it to people in specific industries to work out kinks with it. I guess they thought it was a bit too volatile to release. Uh, but I would see, though, where the barrier of having a wall in front of you and, like, a box around your face, that is enough to dissuade people. However, if you just have your glasses on, you got a movie running in your eye, maybe that's not so controversial. Maybe you're still hanging out with your significant other on the couch. With a pass-through camera picture-in-picture. Picture. That way you can keep an eye on your backpack so you don't get well, robbed. The pass-through camera is the first step, but I think the glasses are the actual way that it ends, yeah, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. But why... I, I, there's, maybe there's a solution to this problem and maybe there doesn't need to be a solution to this problem and I'm just being 
naive and that's possible maybe you guys are steve jobs and i'm the guy who's like i'm not going to give you a 500 hundred dollar loan to start a computer company they're never going to take off <laughs> but why are like if i already wear glasses how am i going to use ar glasses i'm going to get prescription ar glasses yeah, you get I, prescription. I just don't see it I and then people who, you're going to go you're going to be like hey uh lens crafters can i get prescription ar glasses yeah they're going to cost like four thousand dollars but you can get them <laughs> And then people who don't wear glasses are like, you know what? Instead of just looking at my phone to watch a video, I'd much rather wear a piece of furniture on my head at all times. <laughs> people wear sunglasses. People buy prescription sunglasses. It's not that big a thing. I don't think it that's is so that much more different than prescription sunglasses. Sunglasses are like polarized glass. This is like a an OLED film broadcasting high resolution video. Aren't you, aren't you willing, though, to consider the possibility that this conversation will seem silly in five to six years when I all of us could are seem wearing... Silly for, I think it could seem silly for two reasons. Yeah, no, but I'm <laughs> saying, like, I, I, like we, we underestimate the, the rapid progression of technology. Yeah, right? we're, I, I, I love finishing the Roundtable podcast. I go put on 3D glasses in my house and watch my 3D movies on my Sony 3D no, TV. It requires a societal tipping point. You're right about that. Yeah. But I think it's conceivable to believe that that could be a thing people are interested enough in if the technology outpaces uh, the skepticism about it. And I think it could. I'm going to hop on your side of the fence for a second, though, because I do kind of see your point there. Well, like, I do wonder if people actually want the AR stuff. Like, the VR is kind of a different story, I think. But with the alternative reality, with the Google Glass, with that sort of thing... Do you think people really want it? Because it's not, it's not caught on, obviously, from the most recent iteration. And, like, how much does it really improve your life I mean, over the course I, of the I, day? I want AR stuff on my phone, mm -hmm. but I don't want, like, I don't, I don't feel like I need a standalone AR device for me personally. I was also the guy in 2007 that was like, why would I need a smartphone? I already have a flip phone yeah. that does everything I could conceivably <laughs> See, this need. is exactly why I think you're maybe on the... However, I was also the guy who said the Ouya is stupid. And uh, oh, okay. ain't nobody using their Ouya in this day and age. Well, I think <laughs> the thing you're not seeing is that this is actually a natural link from wearable technology in that people are wearing smart watches. They're wearing things that measure their vitals. Mm. Uh, the next step is to have stuff like GPS being projected in front of your eyes. That's actually helpful and useful. You can like already having... do that with AR and a phone, like with as long as it has a pass-through camera. But you don't like, have to touch it with if it's in your glasses. That's kind of helpful. No, you You're don't driving. have to touch it, but it has to touch you at a hundred percent of the time. Yeah, I don't have a problem with that. I have a problem with that. I don't mm. need like a. I don't know. Again, maybe I'm just being the luddite, but I I don't need a, a augmentation to my glasses that is like you should turn right here. I could if if I could just hit a single button on my phone, hold it up, and have an arrow appear that's like turn right on Nelson Street or something. That's like, kind of what I'm... I already own the device. Yeah, and the device is fairly expensive, and it's integrated in like every other aspect of my life. So, like, if that can do AR, I don't. I don't want to go to bed at night and be like, I have to plug in my glasses. <laughs> that's my not yet. People plug in their watches though, and that's not that much different. But they're not. But nobody bought Google Glass, I guess. Like, I I think that there is. I, I get smartwatches to some extent, uh, and I get Fitbits to some extent. If you're like an enthusiast about that lifestyle, but I I just don't get the like smart glass heads up display at all like a hundred percent of the time. Well, like no, I understand your argument now because, like you said, like when, when you're talking about one of the most practical things we can envision right now for the things like Google Glass is that GPS live on cue. But like you said, like we already have that. It's just a step removed. And that's not enough for people to want to take on an entire new stage of innovative technology. They don't want to be like, well, it makes my GPS 0.5 seconds faster. Yeah. And that makes sense. Mm -hmm. So there's got to be like, there's got to be some sort of big incentive, just like you've been saying how there needs to be like some sort of killer app for VR to actually drive people to use it. There needs to be an actual practical incentive for that sort of thing before people will be like, oh yeah, this we need to make this a part of societal yeah. norms and like our lifestyle to improve everything, which is what that's most that's, big technology has done for us. That's what I meant when I said that the technology needs to outpace the skepticism. It needs mm. to be big enough that people go, oh wait, there's a gap here in our lives in terms of either usability or accessibility that this thing covers. Yeah, yeah. And right now the, the technology just isn't powerful enough to make that gap happen. Exactly. Right? It's not, it's not, there's, there's not like a, as, 
two week battery that you could put in the thing that makes the battery not a factor anymore. Mm -hmm. Right. There's not some kind of transformative app. So I think it could happen. We're just not there yet. And even VR is still kind of behind the times in regards to that, but it at least works now. I think it's also the kind of thing where we don't even know what we want right now. We're going to once people figure out how to make life five times easier with some sort of, sort of weird AR trick that doctors hate him for. But like right now, I, I can't even conceive of what I want AR to do to improve my life. So I guess that's kind of where we're at with that now. There, anyway. I have one application for AR that I want to see. Okay, hit me. I want to, here's what, I want to be able to point my phone at uh, a, an array of no parking signs that are like parking rules. You park here Saturdays, 8 p.m. to 2 a.m., but mm -hmm. not on, if it's an odd numbered Saturday, you can't park here. I wanted to analyze that and then put green on the road if I can park my car there and red mm -hmm. if I can't park my car there. I do I wanted like to run through the, the bevy of conflicting instructions and be like, <laughs> you can park here right now. <laughs> that's that's the one AR thing I want immediately. That is good. I, That'll never happen. <laughs> <laughs> that makes me think of the another uh, future thing that I've been hoping for one day, which is like the, you know, the on the fly translators, which are basically in mm. existence now with those new Google headphones, which is pretty wild. Like yeah, I saw that. The fact that they can universally translate more or less is pretty outstanding. languages, I think? Yeah, yeah. Like, man. That is some cool Imagine tech. you're wearing glasses, though, that when you arrive in a foreign country, all the signs you are translated. Read this, see, there you go. Yeah, there's another yeah. good one. Okay, I can Imagine that. wearing glasses where uh, every 30 minutes yeah. they serve an unskippable 60-second ad okay, to your yeah, let's vision go down that you that can't road. look away from. You have to, though. <laughs> <laughs> what do you mean, do I have to? Like, I, why nature? I'm the dude who, when the technology comes out, I'm like, I don't mind watching the ad. You gonna feel like everybody those? else is like I don't I, I don't never want to see ads, but you want ads in front of your face on, a, <laughs> on an unskippable level. Like, all right. <laughs> I don't uh, care. You take take the thought straight from my brain. If, if I am consenting to sign on the dotted line to get AR enabled glasses at all times, just put you're the chip. the anti luddite, and then you're immediately throwing shade at anything that's. I love I love technology. I just think this is like flying cars technology. And people are entitled to disagree with me. You guys are entitled to disagree with me. I don't think you guys are being ignorant. I don't. I just. I dispute the idea that because I am a disbeliever in AR-enabled glasses, that I like want to live in the Stone Age. There's like self-driving cars. I'm a believer. But like this, you know, AR-enabled glasses. It's a logical extreme here. It's not you wear, you wear on your face. I don't buy it. I just. And but I'm the. I'm, I don't really believe in VR yet either. Yeah. Which yeah. is why, like, when it comes to the Oculus Go, I'm like, ah, I'll believe it when I see it. Mm -hmm. It could happen, but. Uh, another quick bit of Oculus news, as I mentioned here, uh, they have indeed permanently reduced that price to three ninety nine with the touch controller bundle, down from seven ninety nine as recently as February of this year, uh, before of course hitting that price drop for the uh, the sale they did for the summer of Rift promotion uh, a couple of months ago. So they've seen big success from that, and they've elected to keep the price point down at that rate, which I'm sure just makes Nick extremely happy. With his purchase yet again. I'm sorry, I keep doing it. Bennett Foddy has destroyed and shredded my soul into nothing, so I don't feel any pain anymore. I'm fine. Good. Oh, man. So, yeah, there you go. Good news again for those of you hoping for uh, more Oculus price drops. And you know what? Hold out for another three months because maybe it's going to be $2.99 by the end of the year. Might as well find out. Or maybe Oculus will be destroyed. Maybe. <laughs> One of the two. <laughs> well, Zuckerberg's going to have to divest his interest for his presidential run in, in 2020. So True. yeah, oh, that, there's your, uh, <laughs> there's Dude, your that's, fork in the road. That's actually going to happen. It's like a guarantee at this point. Mark Zuckerberg is running for president. That's the world. Yeah, we're hasn't in. The Rock officially filed as well for a 2020 run? Recently? I wouldn't be surprised. Yeah, which he, he'll, he'll probably win. Actually, that's the thing. It's like Mark Zuckerberg's running for president, but The Rock's probably going to be president, which is going to be pretty wild. Uh, anyway. Here's our political take here for Roundtable. Uh, a little bit more Oculus news as well. Uh, Respawn Entertainment, the developers of Titanfall, have some sort of super secret VR project underway. They've been working with Oculus to uh, develop a first-person combat VR experience set to release in 2019. So not a lot of details about this. Suffice to say that that's pretty, uh, pretty big news coming from Respawn. That's a big developer to... Uh, T take on that kind of project that gives me even more hope for the future of vr so there we go more the positive. first official full game released in vr 
Maybe. I mean, let's we'd have to be really careful dancing around that. There's been a few, but it's a bit of a shot, honestly. Yeah, but... yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, geez, the the Rick and Morty game was pretty full fleshed, I'd say. So, wasn't it like forty minutes long? No, it was like three hours. Eh, but okay, you know, it's that's, longer than that's pretty probably. damn good for VR. Uh so yeah, there you go. Just exciting stuff there. Uh, and then just one more quick little tidbit as well. Uh, I mentioned this briefly, but v, uh, or, uh, Valve has announced a big change coming for Steam VR 2.0. Uh, it's going to be much, much bigger. Uh, apparently, with their new tracking system, as well as the addition of additional uh, tracking boxes uh, that you can put into your space, they are going to be able to increase the playing area from 11.5 square feet to 10 square meters or about 33 square feet, which is pretty outstanding, like three times the size. Uh, so that's got a lot of uh, a lot of different ideas attached to it as well as far as what they can do with VR moving forward. But, of course, that does uh, rely upon the consumers themselves having that sort of space available within their houses, which I know for a fact that a lot of us were struggling to even meet the whatever it was, like four by five space that they give you uh, to do the Vive and Oculus right now. So I don't know if anybody's really going to be able to m meet 33 square feet. That seems pretty nuts. <laughs> you got like a two by five hallway yeah. of walkable <laughs> space here. Yeah, no, that does not apply here. Yeah, you're going to need to rent out a warehouse or something. But <laughs> yeah, so interesting stuff there too. They're lo working on some uh, lenses as well, apparently. Valve has been uh, working on custom built VR headset lenses. Uh, to allow other companies to produce their own headsets that can be custom fitted. So, interesting stuff there too. It's just, this is all like, Oculus I think has really kind of stirred the pot for all the VR developers and big players right now and kind of gotten the wheels turning again where everyone was kind of just like waiting to see what would happen and then that big price drop hit, all of a sudden all this new tech is coming around, all of a sudden Valve is starting to talk a lot more, so... It's just good. I'm just I'm really excited for this. It, it seemed like it was dead in the water for a little while there, and now we're seeing a lot of different activity in action. So, it's cool. I'm excited. Uh, thoughts on that? Or I, I can. Yay! You know. VR is not dead. Yay! VR, great. Yeah, that is how I feel. And there's also one more big VR thing. This is very very early on in fact Kickstarter phase, but it is worth noting. I feel uh, the Pimax, which is a company that has been around for a little while. Uh, but they have just put up their Kickstarter about 10 days ago, and they've already breached 1.5 million raised uh, for their 8K VR headset, which... 8K bear? Yeah. Don't you think that's a little pie in the sky? <laughs> no. No. <sighs> it's not. It's, it's, it's real. This is real. This is real stuff. It's going to cost 8K when you buy it. Oh, no, man, know. they got prices, too. Oh, goodness. You guys are, on me. you got to join me in the future here, okay? L liven it That's up. a very patronizing way to phrase that. <laughs> a Kickstarter <laughs> promises the world. you got to join me in the future. <laughs> Does it support the game stick? The game stick? Oh, that's the other Kickstarter success open source Android-based console that nobody owns, but everybody acts. We're going to have this conversation? We're going to have the Look, I'm just saying, Kickstarter only broods failures Kickstarter conversation? <laughs> The I'm just saying they that's what I that's what I'm saying though is these guys have been around it's not like this is their first rodeo so they yeah. had the uh, they had the 4K headset that they released last year to uh you know lukewarm success but now they've uh, obviously hit their stride here to the form, to the tune of 1.6 mil with their uh, 8K VR headset they've also demoed this quite a bit at uh, various events various cons so They've they've got a real product, man. It's not just not just speculation. They've got an actual thing here, and they're even uh, planning on delivery by December of this year. So it's not like it's that far out either. So kind not of the kind of chat, but Ouya was also an actual product <laughs> that was in existence. The <laughs> guys are making these fucking false equivalencies that well, I'm not it, it going to swallow the anymore. moon and it's going to be ready in three months? That's incredible. It's already basically I, ready. That's why I they're thought doing you, it. I thought you were going to say some bad news, but uh, <laughs> no, the fact that they, you know, did a Kickstarter for $200,000. It solves the problem of the months. screen door effect. It basically removes motion sickness and it'll suck your dick. It'll just suck it. <laughs> Oh wait, it will. Yep, that's what it'll oh, do. I didn't see that on there. All right, I'm in. Mm -hmm. You do have to. You have to back it at the thousand dollar level, though. That's fair enough. I'm yeah. in. Physically in. Mm -hmm. 
The headset. Oh, no, yeah, no, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. Your your dick. I get it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's an awful looking headset. I really hope it doesn't it's look like so, that. I didn't want to say anything, but it's so. Oh, oh that's some some Star Trek wannabe shit right there, man. That is an interesting. That make, look. O- makes Oculus look like heaven. Like. They do it. It's got to be so. I'm going to give Chad a little visual aid here, though. But, like, they've got to make it that wide because it's got the 200 degree angle of vision. They got to get your peripheral, man. They got to cover yeah, all the angles. They, they put the freaking V, though. <laughs> <laughs> Here's an excerpt from a user review. Oh, sweet lord, that thing is hideous. <laughs> the clarity of the display was sharper than my samurai sword I was wielding in Fruit Ninja. <laughs> God, that thing is horrible. There's no more optimism on this show anymore. It's just it's not, me no, trying to bring this, this positivity through this layer of an cynicism. Announcement, a, a press release announcement of a consumer product that they want you to back is not something to be optimistic about. I could, like, cosplay Genji with that thing, though. <laughs> you could. That's not if a bad it comes idea. out and it's awesome, then that's cool. <laughs> but, like, otherwise, I don't I'm just very skeptical. All right. God, I want an 8K headset. That'll be great. 4K resolution yeah. on each eye, motherfucker? That's a lot of Enjoy pixels. Xbox. I'm with you. I hope that it gets better and wireless. Yeah, for sure. Anyway, there we go. Let's talk about something that'll make us a lot more happy. Loot boxes. (laughs) You dick. (laughs) So we talked about this extensively last week, so I'm not going to, I'm not going to dwell on too much, but I did want to bring it back because we have, uh, we have some comments from the heavy hitters. Peggy, uh, the pan European game information, something like that. And then the ESRB, the entertainment software ratings board, I think. I think I got my info on those acronyms correct. Both organizations responsible for the rating of games and uh, game-like things uh, have weighed in on their opinions on this loot box, our loot boxes gambling controversy, if you want to call it that. Uh, Both organizations have more or less put forward the same stance, which is to say, no, they do not see loot boxes as gambling. A direct quote from an ESRB spokesperson says, ESRB does not consider loot boxes to be gambling. While there's an element of chance in these mechanics, the player is always guaranteed to receive in-game content, even if the player unfortunately receives something they don't want. We think of it as a similar principle to collectible card games. Sometimes you'll open a pack and get a brand new holographic card you've had your eye on for a while, but other times you'll end up with a pack of cards you already have. Uh, Peggy, as I mentioned, has more or less uh, given a similar statement uh, they even went so far as to say that their approach is similar to that of the ESRB, uh, as well as most ratings boards, uh, that the responsibility uh, falls upon the National Gambling Commission uh, to determine whether or not that is indeed a form of gambling. So there's the, there's the opinions of the basically the folks that matter telling you, well, no, no, it's not gambling. When I play a slot machine, I'm guaranteed to get some pictures and a noise, but I might not get money, which is what I want. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I was going to take it even like a different way. And then if you buy a pack of cards, like you used in that example, there's going to be a value set on each one of those cards, which you could then sell. Mm -hmm. So if you just take the money as the card, you're just spinning a roulette wheel, basically, or a slot machine. Yeah. That's that's gambling to me. Me too. Right? (laughs) (laughs) Not according to them. Huh. I think it like... Like I, I, I said this last week as well, Like this is still such a weird gray area that isn't really policed at all, I don't think. Like, it's just sort of happening and everyone's kind of like, yeah, you know, like, it's you know, just, let's not worry about it yet. We don't have to, until some massive issue arises with some multi-million dollar lawsuit that establishes a precedent here, kind of just can let it be, you know, like, let it exist in its own marketplace and... Uh, economy almost to uh, sustain itself and that's fine for now but I, I guess the the issue of whether or not it is gambling it's more of just a hot button topic right now and not necessarily anything that's gonna help us clarify a point would you say like yeah there's like there's like some semantic problems I yeah. think is the issue like is it is it a gamble yeah, like by definition, because you, you're buying something and you don't know what you're going to get out of it. 
at least except in a broad sense. You know, I'm going to get some in-game currency or experience or whatever. I'll get something. Exactly. But I actually think like on a on a on an analytical level, it's like worse than gambling because when you gamble, you can win money. I'm Even not suggesting that I'm not suggesting it's likely. I'm just suggesting, mm-hmm. you know, if you get lucky on a roulette spin, you can win money. If you put five bucks into Shadow of War, you might get a, a legendary item, but you know, you're, you're never coming out ahead from a financial level. So you're saying it's worse than gambling. And I, I'm saying oh. that, I mean, from a, a expected, like like an expected value or return on investment level. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you could, you, you could also make the argument. It's probably a lot easier to go to a casino and lose like $10,000 than it is to spend $10,000 on rocket league. No, you haven't seen yeah. Me. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. But like, I, I think I'm almost, if, if my kid was like, 18 and they were like dad i lost a grand at the casino i'd be like pissed Hmm. if they were like dad i spent a thousand dollars on candy crush i'd be like we're going to the doctor (laughs) to talk to the doctor because that's just like i i still am of the opinion that the the loot boxes um are not all predatory but they kind of prey on human psychology and the idea that like the family guy quote of like you know the mystery box could be anything it could even be a boat like there's something in a lot of people's brains that is just like i would much rather experience the thrill of not knowing what i'm gonna get that could be good than just buying something that i already know what it is which is like unexciting Mm -hmm. it's interesting the logic that you just gave that and I, i agree with you that by their definition, that's worse than gambling, but that's all the defense they give with why it's not as bad as gambling. Yeah, yeah. That's weird. A little counter- <laughs> I don't know how they justify that exactly. I guess that's just their way of saying we don't want to take a stance, so we're just going to say something arbitrary and hope that's it That's kind of what I feel like, man. It's like yeah. no one really wants to be the one to say it is what it is. They're even being like, well, I mean, it's not our responsibility. It's the National Gambling Commission. They're yeah. the ones actually yeah. responsible for this. Well, get to, like, when... What is gambling, and does gambling actually mean a problem? Have we agreed? Is it is it universally agreed upon that gambling's a problem? Mm-hmm. Do you need to be 18 to gamble? Um, uh, too much. Push it all away. This is all just- I actually just like don't even care about loot boxes, except in situations where they're predatory, mm-hmm. as well. Like, it, and even like taking a step back from that, it, except in situations where they like markedly and clearly affect the design of the game. So, you know, the the stuff that was rattling people, I think about Shadow of War, was not necessarily that there's egregious loot boxes because there's egregious loot boxes in like a lot of games these days. Mm. But it was the perfect storm of like gating content and also you know people have the perception it's a triple a game it's already going to be making a lot of money and then there's also the uh idea that like you know they're double dipping because it's it's 60 bucks and they want you to buy it like it, it had like everything all coalescing at once yeah and the donation thing so it was like a dog pile on top exactly of it. yeah there's like that's kind of the reason this is even becoming a conversation right now is the fact that it's gotten to this point. I don't think we'd even be talking about it if it weren't for the fact that there's been multiple instances now of the publishers just making them worse and worse and worse to the point where now we're having to ask ourselves, is this is this worthy of legal interference? Which I is ho- a crazy I hope question. So. But at the same time, like, and I'm not trying to blame the consumer, but the reason that they're even as bad as they are is because the consumer clearly continues to buy them. Yeah, They are making hand yeah, it's over working. fist a fuck ton of money out mm-hmm. of these things. As a business, why would they not continue to do so? Even with all the backlash, I guarantee you they're making fuck tons of money off of these loot boxes because the average consumer doesn't care and they will just pump money into it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I was reading uh, this other article this past week as well. I think, uh, yeah, here it is. It says, uh, games as a service has, quote, tripled the industry's value. So, yeah. you know, like, that that's, we, we know that by now, of course, that, you know, this is the new way to do it. You got to release a $60 game with microtransaction elements, loot boxes, the whole nine yards. And like you said, that's that's working. 
Like, here's a direct quote from the report. It says, Consumers are less willing to pay $60 for a boxed game and instead choose titles with a steady stream of new content. Publishers seek to meet these expectations and have adopted a games-as-service model, releasing fewer titles over time while keeping players engaged longer with regular updates and add-ons. So, like, Overwatch is a great example of this now. It's got every element of this where it's got, like, the microtransactions, the loot boxes, the cosmetic upgrades, all this stuff. And they are kind of acting as that games-as-a-service model where they're continually pumping new shit into Overwatch so that people don't have to go buy a new game. They've just got this one thing that's serving as their platform to pump money into continuously. That's but that the makes new sense model. for something like Overwatch, where like you pay one price and for the rest of the game's life you get every hero, every map, and loot boxes are cosmetic and like voice lines. Yeah, I think that's the less like that kind of loot box system is in my mind like it doesn't bother me. Mm -hmm. like, I don't mind loot boxes that are like sweet you are gonna get skins and you might look cool and you might have a cool spray to spray on it but you paid money so you're gonna get every hero they're not locking heroes behind new purchases sure yeah so that makes sense like i'm okay with that it's it's stuff where they lock game content behind like other things and and they kind of segregate the player base by having like well if you buy the gold version you get these two maps but the normal people don't get these two maps and and that kind of thing yeah I'm even at the point where now I'm I'm honestly like like I don't really have a great personal anecdote to share about this but I've I've seen and you know experienced enough of it to be like I can't stand the tampering of progression via loot boxes or microtransactions like it's it's becoming annoying now that I I am fully aware of the fact that if I spent 5 or 10 dollars I would like hyper accelerate my progression through the game which is just it's it's it bothers me like I, I can't just ignore or gloss over that anymore be because it's become so obvious at this point yeah the worst factor for me is not understanding how a game is structured anymore because it's more about the monetization model for the game than it is creating a game at this point yeah exactly you yeah. need to have a new way to review them that can somehow clearly explain what you're paying for and what you're getting and it's never as simple anymore as you just buy a game and here's the game mm-hmm because the games as a service is taking over the entire industry and it's yeah and, for and a all good games are becoming homogenous as a result because it's more about figuring out how to fit x property into x monetization model mm -hmm. yeah uh but yeah anyway i don't want to like i said i don't want to dwell on this too much because we did spend quite a bit of time on it last week yeah. but suffice yeah. to say that's the uh the opinion of the esrb and peggy on the matter and uh, we'll see if that turns into anything else i don't think it will though i think that's kind of the nail in the coffin for that uh, and hey, Nick, let me hear a little bit about Carried Away, please. Yeah, Carried Away is a cute little uh, skiing physics game, essentially, where you build ski lifts to carry players up mountains uh, using physics models, essentially creating struts and making a uh, belt that runs over the top of the struts to then allow the progression up. Uh, now, what you have to manage during the course of that is the weight distribution uh, the stress over the different struts that you built and what kind of material they're made out of and make sure that everybody makes it up without everything crumbling. Um, now there's a bunch of different types of challenges though. It's not just building essentially, you know, different types of bridges in this case. There's also ski jumps. They also let you play as the skiers for a moment and actually uh, help them along with their jumps. There's literal bridges. There's multiple types of ski lifts. And it's just wrapped in a nice little, uh, happy little bow. It's a very comforting game. It reminds me a little bit of Poly Bridge, but obviously more of a snow-themed one. Um, and just, just an enjoyable time. I mean, there's not all that much to it, but what it does, it does well. And if you're in the mood for something kind of calming, uh, where you can mess around with a little bit of minor engineering, I think this is a good one. Yeah. For sure. I played a little bit of it myself as well. Easiest recommendation if, in the world. If you ever enjoyed Polybridge, you're going to love the hell out of this. It's basically the same kind of experience. Uh, it's like you said, like the presentation is actually, I, I enjoyed it quite a bit. Like it's got a, a really uh, well put together and uh, the concise approach to everything. Uh, it tutorializes well. It teaches you about all the elements pretty quickly to the point where I was dealing with basically everything the game had to offer. Uh, over the course of like an hour and a half or so. So that was, you know, it's, it's the, again, like you mentioned, it's not much to it, but what it has is really well done, I think. And uh, it's, it's, it's fun and works well too. Like it, it, the controls for construction, uh, I think are really well done where it's so easy to place a bunch of stuff at the same time. And not only can you do that, but like manipulating the things you've already put down is surprisingly like intuitive. 
where like you can kind of just like drag elements to fit them exactly where you want them to. If if you can't reach with like one plank, you, you're just like an inch away from being able to connect it to another thing. It's really actually pretty simple to like adjust your entire bridge just by right clicking and dragging some elements around to be able to like refit that and make it work out. So I really it even shows that. a radius map on each node yeah, to yeah. show what you can and can't reach from that point, which I think is just like a great touch. Mm -hmm. um, and in addition, it's got sort of a world map overworld type, uh, type of theme for how you uh, choose which mission to take on next. And if you're not in the mood for something more challenging, you can go, you know, stay at the same difficulty or go lower uh, where you can eventually, you know, work through all of them. Um, and it, it did get not really difficult by the end of the first mountain, but it was like, okay, this is going to take a minute to sort out. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I like the difficulty pacing, although I don't know how much harder it gets beyond that. They did only play it for about an hour or so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's got a workshop support as well, so pretty much endless replayability there for as long as uh, folks continue to want to make new stuff. And like you said, you've got your own uh, custom level editor in there as well, so the uh, the sky is the limit as far as carried yeah. away is concerned. But Did yeah. you mess with the level editor? Because it's got a really cool effect when you drag the nodes for the mountain around. Oh, it you actually, can do that? It actually like, sculpts itself as you move. There's like a dot mm. at the peak. You can make more dots and then have different peaks and then shift them around and it all moves on the fly. That's cool. I like that, yeah. Neat. No, I didn't actually check it out, but I, I think I will, actually. I like this yeah. one enough to maybe even stream it a little bit. So I had a, had a pretty good time with it. Uh, yeah, not much, again, not much to it, but it's in early access right now. They are uh, planning a schedule of about 6 to 12 months. Did just come out in early access as well, so you want to you know, probably be aware of that. This is pretty early on in development, so there's a possibility you run into some bugs, some issues with it, but... Uh, what we've played so it, far, pretty damn good. It seemed really solid for early access to me. I didn't mm -hmm. run into any bugs, and it all seems quite polished. Everything seemed to work as it would it be expected to work, and yeah, no real complaints, honestly. It was just fun. Mm -hmm. Yep. There we go. It's Carried Away. This came out October 4th by Huge Calf Studios. I don't know if they put out anything before this one. It doesn't look like it. Yeah, um, they were new to me. Mm -hmm. That is nine bucks. You can get it on Steam right now. Mathis, let me hear about the Scorn Alpha. Sure. So Scorn uh, sent out, uh, I don't know if they sent it to like press and like YouTubers and whatnot, but it's like a 20 minute uh, alpha of their new first person horror game. They call, I think they call it like a first person shooter slash adventure horror game um, that visually is very much HR. Uh, is it Geiger, Geiger or Giger? Geiger. Is it HR Geiger inspired mm -hmm. kind of biomechanical um game where I, the the demo does not tell you jack diddly squat about the story i have no idea what's going on um and basically the whole point of the demo is just getting from point a to point b and solving a couple of very light puzzles along the way and uh i found myself actually hating the demo oh <laughs> I, man I played it for about an hour because it took me an hour to get through it. And a lot of it was trial and error for me uh, because they don't explain anything. The demo just starts up and you're just like, they're like, go. And that's it. They don't, they don't explain the, any of the controls, which is not that big a deal. How any of the puzzles work, how any of the machines work. And they're kind of like, you're left to kind of figure things out. And there are a couple of instant death traps in the game in the, in the demo itself that pissed me off. Um, and I ended up, having to constantly stumble and die just to realize that they were there so that next time I started up, I could get through them. And since the demo is like only 20 minutes long from start to finish, there's no auto save. So every time you die, you're sent right back to the beginning of the demo and mm -hmm. you have to do it all over again. Um, there's some action, some shooting mechanics with the gun, uh, but it's okay feeling. Um, and I think Ryan, you said, is that the game that looks like a, a unreal engine kind of like acid flip sort of thing? No, I wouldn't say asset flip, but more like uh, it's one of those games that's like, hey, look at how it's easy very it is. Yeah, 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 look at how yeah. easy it is to make things look like kind of shiny and cool and, yeah, yeah. and unreal. I agree with you. I actually kind of walked away after playing that feeling the same way. Like the demo initially is very visually uh, impressive because I'm like, oh, this is a really cool art style. But the whole demo feels exact. Like the, the looks never change. And after dying and playing the game for like an hour, I'm like, all right, I'm sick of this. Like, I just want to be done with it. It's not that fun. The puzzles are not that smart. Uh, the fact the fact that in order to figure out the puzzles, I had to die. And then I died and I'm like, okay, that's how the puzzle works. That's not like 
smart puzzle design that's just infuriating puzzle design mm -hmm. uh it's like that that beginner's instant death trap that you get in old games where like well now you know there's a man-eating worm in that room don't go in there yeah 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 i hate that and 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 there was some of that in the scorn alpha demo and i was like yeah i walked away saying i'm not really excited for this game and i think nick you said you have a slightly different outlook yeah, on it. But. i don't think uh it's as representative as you're giving it credit for being that it's an alpha this was largely i think just to show off the art style and i think they made some really bad decisions in how they compiled it uh, i don't well i want to believe anyway that it's not going to be very representative beyond the art style in the actual game and the point you made about the the worm thing killing you instantly completely agree that was nonsense that should not have been in there at all um and the then, goal of it was you see it it kills you you come back the next time and you lift it on an elevator and then it's not there so you can pass yeah see i died to it twice because like and maybe it was just the order of things that i figured out so like i died to it the first time i was like okay cool then i did the elevator thing and then they give you a gun and i was like oh maybe i'm supposed to shoot it now and then i go back in there shoot it and i die again i'm like oh that's the, what the heck's the gun for oh it's just to kill like, yeah well the bigger enemies. problem is it blurs your vision immediately as soon as yep. you see it which means you can't really run away but if you could run away, you actually get maybe five or six seconds before it kills you. So I think yeah. it's just a bunch of like unfortunate design decisions that added up to something really bad. Uh, I think the art style, though, is absolutely brilliant. There's not very many games that look like this that even exist. Mm -hmm. So I just, I love that. Like, we called it Flesh Punk. In <laughs> the <laughs> That's a good name. Uh, because there's not exactly a great name for it. I know there's a few artists that have dealt in that sort of style, and very oftentimes it gets muddled to the point where it looks sort of generic. Um, and there are moments where you're like, oh, this is kind of like Quake 2 aesthetic a little bit. Yeah. But yeah, then yeah. it isn't, because everything's really like covered in gore and weird fleshiness. And the fact that your character is like a gaping open torso, I mean, they've yeah. set this up that there's some inherent mystery to it that intrigues me greatly. Um, the organic gun is rather unique. I haven't seen much to do with that aside from maybe Prey, um, the original Prey. I, haven't I actually said that in while playing in my video. I'm like, this gun reminds me of Prey, like the very first yeah. Prey. Mm. There's like sphincters and things on the walls. It's It's got that organic thing going on. And mm -hmm. I, I would love to see it when it's done. I'm very excited to play it, even though the demo was not great. The, the one hit KO thing and then the lack of quick saves was actually really awful. Like that is not a good way to make a first impression is to frustrate people into playing the same section with like yeah. a two minute load between each time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's not fun. I yeah. mean, you yeah. sent this out to people <laughs> asking them to make videos about it. You know what I mean? Like you knew that people were gonna be playing through this publicly in front of thousands of people. Kind of maybe make sure it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> but it, I think it did evoke the proper ambience, at least. Uh, the fact that it's super creepy and these hallways are just dripping with just oozing gross stuff. There's like these weird fleshy dogs that are going to chase after you. I didn't know what anything was. Mm -hmm. And I was just interested in seeing what might come up next. I was just sad that it didn't go on further. And uh, it actually crashed when I think I got to the end of it. So oh, all, really? the whole thing was kind of just a mess from the from a design perspective. But it's also an alpha, and, well, you know, shit happens. Mm -hmm. I just don't want to hold the whole game to that standard because I think it's going to be better than that. It's still, least, is it still a ways out? I don't know. The fact that yeah. they had to do Kickstarter stuff all of a sudden made me wonder because I thought it was supposed to be out this year. Oh, okay. uh, so maybe they hit a problem in development. And, I mean, there wasn't much meat to that demo. No. But I would also chalk that up to them not wanting to spoil too much about the game and to not spoil much about the game probably involves re-piecing together a bunch of pre-made stuff they had in the game already, which then how much of that do you put in, right? So that mm -hmm. was kind of what I figured was wrong there. Um, they're just, they wanted to keep it, to their, their hand too close to their chest, I think. Gotcha. Yeah, I walked away, I think, with similar opinions to Nick. I'm maybe a little bit more negative than Nick uh, about it, yeah. but I agree with Nick that it like the aesthetic is really cool, and I love that biomechanical HR Giger style like look. But um, the gameplay was not impressive. You didn't you didn't believe me when I said Geiger? Giger. I saw his chat going Giger 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 Giger. Is so Giger? I'm, Giger. I'm pretty sure it's Geiger. There's a, there's few there's a few other artists as well. It's not just him, and I don't even think he's the most influential for that exact style. He's just the one that's the most common in pop culture, I would say. For the past yeah. two years, our team has been working hard on the development of Scorn, blah, blah, blah. We're getting close to completion of part one, but we're not really satisfied with all the aspects of the game. So they got more Kickstarter funding, and if they're successful with that, which they were, they plan to release it in 2018. 
according to the Kickstarter page. We'll see. I do hope that it's good when it comes out, obviously, because horror, good horror games are not around that often anymore, in my opinion. A lot of horror games, yeah. like the last big horror release was what, Outlast 2, and that was a monstrous disappointment. So We well, got Resident Evil 7 before that. Game. Resident Evil yeah. 7 was great. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah, I give Resident, uh, Resident Evil was awesome. What was the last good one before that? Can you remember? Nick? The one I really loved Nick, last time, maybe like Alien Isolation. Like, I love the Alien Soma. Isolation. Oh, Soma yeah. was good, mm-hmm. yeah. Still but Soma like wasn't that. one of those, like, here's a blockbuster presented type game. I mean, it had beautiful visuals at times, but it was more about the story than I think it was the presentation. Mm-hmm. Alien was a bit more about the presentation, in my opinion. Right. Cool. There you go. Score and Alpha game is uh, just wrapped up another round of Kickstarter funding and uh, looking for a 2018 release. We'll probably see another beta or something of that before the full thing comes around. Uh, Ryan, I'm kind of springing this on you, but I did uh, see you guys play a bit of that Think of the Children game. Do you want to talk about that for a minute or two? Yeah, Think of the Children is basically uh, a co-op, overcooked style comedy action game, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, So you and your partner play as parents. I think you can have up to four people. So you play as parents uh, who have six children, and the children on every level go out and try to get themselves murdered. So there'll be like a level on the beach. They'll swim out in the water and then like a shark will eat them. They'll, you know, play in a sand castle and get stuck in the sand and suffocate. Or, you know, they'll, they'll burn to death because they stood too close to the barbecue. Uh, what you have to do as the parents is kind of like Pikmin it up. So like you're playing as Captain Olimar, you got to run around and be like, this kid's about to, you know, get eaten by a crocodile. So I got to go like run over to him, grab him, and then like, call all the other children in a radius around to come back and then meanwhile while you're doing that you also have a to-do list of things to accomplish like Mm. on the on the beach level you have to like roll out the towels and you know flip the burgers and put out fires that start on the barbecue and apply sunscreen to this old man for whatever reason um and that's basically (laughs) what it is is like uh you have like an objective almost like uh keep talking and nobody explodes and then you have a persistent kind of nagging condition that always shows up where you'll look on the screen and there'll be like a a caution sign and you're like oh no bartholomew is about to be you know eaten or you know crushed by a car or something like that so it's this back and forth tension between i need to get everything on this to-do list done within like 120 seconds while also making sure as few of my children die as possible Mm -hmm. sweet it is in beta um and it's uneven but pretty good the couple, like, we, we played through the whole beta in, like, 90 minutes, maybe. Mm-hmm. The final level is ridiculous. And I will say the beta was also pretty buggy. Like, we, we encountered a lot of situations where, uh, you know, you and your partner have to pick up suitcases, and they're color-coded to you. If you pick up your partner's suitcase, every now and then it just flies through the screen, like, changes color, and it essentially soft-locks the game, like, makes it impossible to complete the objective. Mm-hmm. Um, or you could, like... You could step off of a piece of terrain wrong, and then you just kind of get like wedged in the architecture, and you you have to kill your own character to get out, basically. But I've done that. Yeah, recently. I was just gonna say this problem. sounds really familiar. <laughs> <laughs> Apart from that, like it was it was pretty fun, but I will say after close to two hours of it, I was like, ah, I'm kind of like, I, I'm I don't want to play more right now. But the fact that it has, uh, or at least is promising to have online multiplayer, yeah, is that was kind my of question. A, yep. Yeah, it's not in the beta yet. It only has a local, I think. But the fact that it promises that for the full release is very positive. I think it could add a lot to this game. But uh, yeah, I mean, it's reasonably fun. Cool. It was like it, it reflected worse uh, on the game to be played for an extended period than like a twenty minute PAX demo. But apart from that, I was like, it's, it's pretty good. Okay. Oh, dude, that was perfect. You didn't even mean to. Well done. Just doesn't stop. Echo though. location, where's the duck? Right? <laughs> <laughs> uh, sweet. So, yeah, that's in beta. It is uh, looking at a Q3 2017 release, which is now a lie. So, you know, I don't know what to make of that, but we'll see what happens. Uh, Nick, tell me about Yo. Space Engineers. Space Engineers is a game where you try to build spaceships out of Minecrafty resources. And there seems to be a number of different scenarios. Mm -hmm. And we chose to play one that went really badly and then one that went slightly better. Uh, The first one, we were on a planet, which is rather pretty and filled with weird space dogs for some reason that just looked like Earth dogs. 
don't really know why they were there and they kept biting us. Uh, and we had to like build our base out of resources while finding more resources and defend against alien attacks, which apparently never end. That seemed like hell, and mm. it broke so badly we had to turn it off because the frame rate was just gone to four. Which uh, is apparently a known issue, by the way. There, like that wasn't always the case either for that planet scenario. I don't know what's like specifically going on now, but I guess they did something recently that's completely chugged the frame rate on that uh, mission. Right. So, for that, uh, take that for what it's worth. So we ditched that one in favor of the crashed red ship scenario where our red ship had crashed into an asteroid, as the name implies, mm -hmm. and we're meant to scavenge the outer space, like actually in space environment, uh, on other asteroids to build either... Well, I guess there's a number of ways to approach it. What we chose to do was to build a mining ship to then go to the other asteroids that were further away to then gain the resources to rebuild our ship so we could then leave. I don't even know if there's a win condition in these scenarios. We just were playing it to play it. Mm -hmm. And there's some cool synergistic cooperative things that can come up of it. Uh, for example, uh, Fox and Rob knew more what they were doing. So they were tending to the more complicated details like setting to uh, fix the conveyors in the ship that move resources around. Well, Bear and I were more scavenging just to find the resources we needed to rebuild parts to then add on to the ship. Um, and we weren't really clear on what we were doing for half of it, so it was a bit muddled, uh, yeah. our first hour or two experience. But I think by the end, we started to get a sort of a picture, and it's it's a complicated game, but in a good way. It's sort of like Factorio. Uh, it's very much 3D Factorio in space. Like, that's, I feel like, the easiest way to describe it, because it's it's hitting the nail on the head. It's got all those complicated systems of factorio it's got the automation of factorio it's got like the progressive learning of the game that like it, it's it's complicated when you start off with it where you're looking at all these systems when you load it up like you can click on one of the inventory boxes and it'll show you basically everything at the same time it'll show you like every inventory space you have on your ship including like the refinery and the uh the the other systems that you have to build yourself so you get a little overwhelmed with information at the start, but then you start to like parse it out and realize what's important and realize what you need to use and what you need to do to be able to actually progress. So I right. think that's about the point that me and Nick were starting to get to by the end of like three hours or so where we had just been kind of ditzing around a little while, but then we started to identify like, oh, okay, so that you need to collect all these individual components in order to make the parts necessary to construct a ship which is what we spent the better part of three hours doing. Like we, like Nick said, we were literally flying through space in our spacesuits, uh, going from asteroid to asteroid, looking for resources and like harvesting them with our space drill and bringing them back to the main hub, which is as cool as it sounds, actually. Like I thought it was really neat being able to do that, flying around, setting those points on the GPS, putting them into the chat and like having those sort of systems all coming together and us being able to work toward that common goal. I was having a pretty damn good time by the end of it, were you? Yeah, I think it got better and better as we started to understand what we were actually trying to accomplish versus the sort of obfuscating UI difficulties we were having at the beginning. Yeah. Because it's not an easy game to understand, and the UI doesn't really try very hard to make it easier. No. So learning curve aside, though, I think once you get past that level, it starts to become a bit more obvious that this isn't just sort of a, just a Minecraft kind of game, right? There's more going on here yeah. other than just collecting resources you've got to figure out how to put them together in a way that actually matters. Um, and, and that's where I think the Factorio comparison comes in. It's more about the automation and creating a situation that can double down on itself to then make things easier for you later to then suit a goal. Right. Uh, so for us, the sort of middle ground was us building that mining ship that then led to, well, would have led to if we hadn't finished the session, us then sort of automating the process of collecting the resources to then fix our big ship. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and so, like the yeah. idea of that by itself, you know, like that's that's when you start up Factorio and you're like, we're gonna ro launch a rocket. Oh, cool, yeah, let's do it. But then you realize, oh, there's 50,000 steps that precede that step. So, you know, you gotta kind of take it one yeah. little bit at a time. But when you do begin to make that progress it's actually quite satisfying so yeah i'm glad we didn't do one with combat in the second scenario mm -hmm. because i think that would have just made it more frustrating than fun yeah like we were dying enough just by hitting asteroids because we couldn't slow down in space enough <laughs> <laughs> just splatting ourselves going a million miles an hour surprisingly frequently yeah yeah even though i knew better it still kept happening mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, like yeah, and uh, we're also a little late to the party here. It's worth mentioning. Space Engineers has been around for a while. They came out uh, initial release October 2013. They're now in beta officially. Uh, but they've been in early access basically since that point. Been adding things periodically, and they've uh, presumably made the game quite a bit better than it was in that original state. But uh, yeah. for what we played, it's uh, pretty impressive, uh, very thorough. Lots to do, plenty to experience within this game. Uh, if maybe lacking a little bit in overall direction sometimes, but you know that's kind of par for the course, I guess, for experiences like this. Uh, anything else? I would, uh, I would put it on the same tier as if Astroneer was sort of like Polybridge. It's sort of like a cartoonized like overview of the concept we're going for. Hmm. Then this Space Engineers is more like a proper. Uh, I don't even know what the analog would be like, as if we're really launching a rocket. Like, not quite Kerbal Space Program, mm -hmm. but somewhere in between that with yeah. sort of a Minecraft flavor to it. Yeah. It's it's approachable. Like, it's tough, but y y it's, not like, it's not like a CK2 level of intimidation, you know, like where there's just so much going on. You just yeah. really can't help or hope to uh, figure it out. But with this, you can... You can even by yourself, you'd probably be able to eventually figure things out for your for your own. So, it's it's at a an approachable level. Do you know if it has a tutorial? Because we just jumped into it multiplayer, so I didn't really get to scope it out. I played. Um, I'm trying to remember because I did. I played like 30 minutes for myself. I I think it does. I think it's got a little bit of tutorialization to it for the uh, for the single player campaign. Right. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that's Space Engineers. You get it for 25 bucks. Again, it's in beta at the moment. <clears throat> slash early access on Steam. So, there it is. Mathis, tell me about Evil Within 2, please. Sure. So, Evil Within 2 is the sequel to Evil Within 1, which came out two years ago? Three years ago? Um, something somewhere around there. It's by... Uh, my details are going to be muddled, but like it's by the creative director who oversaw Resident Evil for a while. Um, and he went off to do his own thing. That's where we got Evil Within 1. I played the first Evil Within for like an hour, and I was like, yeah, this game's not that great. And I kind of put it down. Mm. Um, Evil Within 2, I've now put about four hours into it, and I'm really enjoying it. Where Evil Within 1 was a more directed, narrow, kind of classic Resident Evil experience going from one at beginning of a level to the end of the level, counting monsters and all that stuff along the way. Evil Within 2 is more open. It's an open world-ish system with side quests and a main quest that you can follow, uh, lots of uh, loot and stuff you can find around the world. Um, and while it's not terribly scary, uh, the atmosphere in the world presented is really cool. It is, it's kind of like taking the Matrix and Stranger Things and mashing them together into like one concept where uh, the story is you're the same guy from the first game and you discover that your daughter is being used as the central piece to this giant machine that a bunch of people can link themselves into and live in this virtual world. But something's going wrong, and the machine is destabilizing, and you thought your daughter was dead, you find out that she was actually taken by this, this organization to be this like central piece of the machine, and now you're being sent in to go find your daughter and save her and also like save everybody else in this weird machine world. Uh, the visuals are really cool. Uh, the world itself, you can see like pieces of the world, like kind of Inception style, like sideways up in the sky, and, and it's all weird looking. Um, the gameplay itself is fun. It's a lot of stealth. It's stealth oriented with some upgrade systems and RPG light elements. Uh, it's kind of hard to explain because it's just so many different things at once, but it's fun. I'm really actually enjoying the experience. The only thing I don't like, and I don't know if this is maybe just me, uh, but much like the first game, the PC optimization is horrendous. Like mm, yeah. it is absolutely god awful um just keeping an eye on like because I was, I was streaming it and i was getting micro stuttering which is where the game is still saying it's running at 60 frames a second but every so often it would just like stutter 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 even though it would stay at 60 fps mm -hmm. and when i stopped streaming i thought that was just maybe like x splits eating up my piece like my cpu or something and I, I went and i did a bunch of tests and um even on pc when there's no streaming happening it's eating at bare minimum 50 percent of my cpu and when I'm playing, it goes as high as 70 or 80% of my CPU is being used Oof. by the game. Um, and it still micro stutters. There's almost no difference visually between ultra settings and low settings. The game looks identical on both of ultra and low. And the CPU usage changes none. 
on ultra and low. <laughs> I've, I've messed with everything just trying to make yep. this game stop devouring my resources and it just doesn't. It just eats my computer alive for no reason. The game looks good, but it doesn't look that good. Like, yeah. it, it, it is actually ridiculous. And Nick, I don't know if you had that yeah. same problem. I had a lot of problems. Uh, well, so I also tested the difference between ultra and low, and I think I gained maybe five FPS. Um, I did notice the ground looked muddier, but to be honest, on ultra, it looks still really bad sometimes. Yeah. Like, uh, we're talking like early 360 levels of texture quality in certain areas, uh, which is a shame, but also those are the areas that are sort of forgotten in the background of like a bunch of buildings where you're not necessarily meant to have a centerpiece for any visuals. Since it's an open world game to some extent, it does seem to have a lot of little alleyways that are sort of forgotten when it comes to visuals. Um, regarding though, some of the things you mentioned, I, I also played the first of this and thought it was really bad actually like I was really not into it I gave it a chance I think I played about five hours and the story just started to become completely nonsense uh, and it wasn't fun either so I was like why am I playing this this is stupid so anyway I put it down I bought this one today on a whim just because hey it's Friday the 13th I wanted to try it mm -hmm. and maybe it got better and I do think it did the first act the uh, the area we're kind of going through a museumized version of a hotel I thought there were some really compelling visuals there. There was some really good ambience. Um, they kind of dashed it all when the giant lady monster with the chainsaw for a hand chased me. But then again, you need those moments, I guess, if it's going to be like that. Mm. Um, I hope they can get back to that level of atmosphere again. And based on what I've played afterward, they haven't. But I do hope that happens. Uh, a lot of really good touches. The uh, premise being that there's this guy with, like, he takes pictures of you as you're being murdered and then it like dilates time and you can see the last few seconds of them dying over and over again. It reminded me a lot of The Cell. And I know the movie The Cell isn't particularly popular, but visually there was a lot of great stuff that went into that. And I do feel like there's a, a good degree of better artistry that happened in Evil Within 2 from the bit I've played so far. I also found it jumped through a lot of different types of gameplay in the first three hours to the extent where I was like, where are we gonna land here? Because so that we had this moment at the very beginning, it was like, okay, an interview, there's some talking, and then we get to like sci-fi area, and then we're into the dream area, and then we're in our office, and then we go deeper into that, and then we're in the world, and then there's a little bit of ambience for a while, but then it ends up as an open world game. It's like there's a lot of conventions happening. Mm -hmm. We need to settle down on one of those and hopefully build out from there, and I think the open world one is where that eventually happens. Uh, but I do hope it vacillates back to the atmospheric part a bit as well and isn't just so focused on combat. However, I know the pressure of this being sort of a Resident Evil-styled game is to keep the combat up there as one of the top priorities. Um, I just I hope it doesn't only combat is the thing. Was yeah, the, the combat I found super satisfying, though. Like, I enjoyed, like, shooting somebody with a shotgun. It was a, it was a satisfying experience. What were you saying, yeah, Bear? Right. Was the first one all that scary? I played, like I said, I played it for like an hour, an hour and a half, and I was just bored. Yeah. Okay. It had moments of being like kind of shock horror where it was like, okay, all of a sudden you fall in a giant pile of blood, and now you're running down a hallway, and there's a man with a chainsaw trying to cut off your leg. Ah, uh, like, yeah. Okay. Then you just kind of walk around in houses for a really long time in sort of a generic, uh, basically just Resident Evil 4. Like you're just in the village from Resident Evil 4. Okay, okay. More or less. Mm -hmm. With traps everywhere and stuff. And it's like, yeah, pretty boring. Mm hmm. Like I said, this this one in particular isn't like super scary, but the I, I like the the monster design is pretty fucking cool. Like uh, as much as like the lady, the chainsaw lady chasing me down didn't scare me all that much, other than maybe the initial show up and like she's just kind of startled me. Her design overall is really cool. Like I enjoyed that a lot. And there's some really interesting side stuff that you can just miss in the open world. Like um, there was this house that I went into because there's a, one of the things I'm impressed with is a lot of the houses you actually can just go into. And, and explore for, for loot and stuff. I really it's like cool. that. Just in general, and, uh, man. Like, I, I, I fucking love it when a door is able to be opened that you wouldn't expect. Yep. Like, that and makes you can me just so go happy. In, and there's, there's lots of little shacks and stuff they can go into, and there's, like, garages and stuff. And sometimes in those little houses, as you're scavenging for loot, uh, like, there's a little story to be told. And one of the houses I went into, uh, there was this lady who was, like, dead in the bathroom. And I was like, oh, that's weird. But mm. that's not super surprising because the, the game has a lot of that. Uh, and you're walking to a room and her little her little light starts flickering. You're like, oh, that's weird. You go into her bedroom, you find this journal and you see she's written like, there's something in, in the house that I can't see and it's like, it's hunting me, blah, blah, blah. And all of a sudden this like 
very typical like Japanese horror, like ghost girl, more or less, starts stalking you through the house. And you have this like little puzzle you have to figure out to get out of there and, and escape with all the stuff. And that, like those moments, like I'm, that's kind of, that's not the main story. That was off the you side. You can just completely that miss that. Yeah, that was not part of the main story whatsoever. You can just leave that house alone and never go into it. Yeah. Um, and that's cool. I really enjoyed that there was like this little mini mm. horror story that I kind of stumbled across that startled me and she was creepy. She wasn't a monster you were supposed to fight. She was a monster you're supposed to avoid and hide. And uh, that's the kind of horror that really gets me is that helpless feeling. Yeah, yeah. And, the, and it presented that. It was fun. Uh, I liked it a lot. And I'm just, I'm having a good time. It just sucks that the game is Bethesda optimized. Like it's horribly optimized. Mm -hmm. And I, I really wish it, they, I hope they cool. patch it because the day one drivers did nothing to make the game run any better at all. Um, people said the game uh, apparently has Denuvo. And I know Denuvo can cause problems, but also Evil Within 1 wasn't optimized well, so I don't know if that's the problem where it's just like Denuvo is actually causing issues. Mm. You remember that launch, like right? Evil Within 1 was like the worst of the worst. That was, I yeah. believe that was the one where the 24 FPS is cinematic thing came from, wasn't it? It was 24 FPS is cinematic. And well, no, I think that was the, the, order, the Order 1886 is where that initially oh, came from. Oh, okay, I got that, it. Yeah. But, this, but this had like that, they were going with that argument. They had the letterboxing going on and it was like... The crazy aspect ratio. The, the letterboxes were like three quarters of the screen, if I remember. They're like super wide like why it didn't run well it didn't look good but we don't have those problems in this at least it runs mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> no it runs and it just requires most, your entire computer to make it run right and mo it's yeah like it's mostly it's mostly playable uh it's just the micro stuttering is infuriating and i didn't have that issue i just had a lower overall frame rate than you what's your graphics yeah. card uh 980 ti that's also what I have, and I was getting generally around 40 in uh, combat areas. Oh, 60 really? See, in, like smaller scripted areas. I had 60 pretty much the whole time, and occasionally it would drop below, like it would go to like the 40s, but it wouldn't stay there long before it would go back up, and then it would just micro stutter constantly. Hmm. Hmm. So I have no idea. Like, again, I have no idea what's causing it, and I've been trying to figure it out. People are saying they, um, they've removed Denuvo on launch, but. It sounds like you're having the same issues, and you bought it today, right? So yeah, uh, well, yeah, I just didn't Wait, they, have the microstutter. The developers removed it, or people are just removing Chad it. Chad is saying the developers said they removed Denuvo on launch. Oh. I don't know if that's true. Um, I hope it is, but I don't know if it affected anything because I I've been I've had the game for a couple of days now, and I've, I was playing it pre-release, so Denuvo was still a part of it. But oh, are you still on like a beta build or a different branch or something? It was considered the review build. I don't know. Yeah. I haven't played it since it came out, so I don't know if it changed. But hmm. and I am playing it on an SSD as well. So for people who are like, not. well, maybe it's uh, on. <laughs> yeah. All right. Maybe that's why. I wonder if I played on an HDD. Like if that would cause like frames to go below forty. Mm -hmm. Well, maybe you won't have the micro stuttering. I also want to give him props though for not having a season pass and for just yes. having it as a regular game with a regular price and putting the whole game in one box. No loot boxes? <laughs> yeah, there's, there's nothing as far now as I can tell. Now let's not start commending people not for, ha or for not having loot boxes. <laughs> let's draw a line on the sand there. Okay. Anyway, I was just happy that it's like it's the game and you bought it and it's, it's the whole thing. Mm -hmm. All encompassing. Yeah. Like the good old days. That is The Evil Within 2. It's 60 bucks. It's on Steam. Also on uh, PS4, Xbox One. Uh, don't think it came to the Switch, did it? That's probably not a I'm Switch not first title. Yeah, no Switch for you. But there you go. Evil Within 2. It's available now. Uh, and that's going to that's gonna wrap up our docket today. A little bit shorter of a show. We, we do typically hit the full two hours, but we're... A little shorter today. That's you need okay. more time. I did play Shadow of War. Did you play that? You know, I did. I wanted to hear a little bit about Shadow of War, even though uh, we have. I a... have put about ten hours in Shadow of War so far. Mm -hmm. you, wow, that's um, actually insane. Okay, well, here's the caveat to that, though. Yeah. The first five hours is just Shadow of Mordor with less powers. Mm. So if you played Shadow of War, you know what you're getting into with this. It's more killing orcs and like there's more orcs than ever in this one it's like it is shadow of mortar 2 the orc reckoning like there's a ton of orcs everywhere in this game mm -hmm. um but holy crap did i not realize they were not going to give you your dominate powers and get to like what the game is meant to be which is like taking over forts and building an army for like five hours mm -hmm. like the first five hours of the game is just going through and doing the same thing you did in shadow of mortar 
minus the dominating powers. So you're just killing orcs for five hours and nothing else and dealing with Shelob, the spider, who stole your ring and now you have to get the ring back from her. So you're doing all this nonsense shit. Shelob, the spider Mm -hmm. girl. She's but they made her a hot spider waifu oh, yeah, in dude. this one. Mm-hmm. So, um, God, that was super boring. I'm surprised they they made you push through like like that long before they gave you their powers. When you finally do get your dominating powers and you can start building your army and all that stuff, it's fun. Um, it's not that deep. So, and a lot of the the ads and, and stuff, they they kind of like presented like assaulting the fort of an enemy of the enemy to take it as yourself is going to be this huge cool thing where you run with your whole army. That is not what taking over the fort is. Mm-hmm. Like you start outside the fort and you attack and all your orcs run in. But all it is is you're just going to two points within the fort and basically call playing capture the point. And then you capture the point and then you go to the other point and you capture that point and then it unlocks the door to go fight the, the boss of the area. There's no big army versus army fight. Your orcs are running around and they're fighting other orcs, but it doesn't matter mm. at all. And your named orcs are kind of with you the whole time and if they go down you can heal them and bring them back up uh you're just playing capture the point and then that's it there's no big like i'm gonna get on my dragon and and, like breathe fire over all the enemy orcs and stuff no you're just you're just capturing a point and then you're like for honor point like the yeah, way it's like for honor, honor. it's like yeah. single player for honor where you're going to capture a couple that's wow <laughs> <laughs> shadow so, of war is like single with- player for honor Faint praise. <laughs> <laughs> Except the fighting system isn't as fun as For Honor, I guess, or as in depth. It's like For Honor single player, but worse. That's <laughs> oh, that is with a... Batman Arkham Asylum combat. <laughs> yeah, I mean the combat's still fun. Like I don't hate the combat. Like Arkham Arkham combat for me is 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 really enjoyable. You kind of turn your brain off and do your own thing, but it's not hard, and it's still a spectacle spectacle be, to behold when you're just destroying enemies and you know, cutting off their heads and riding dragons and all that stuff. But if you're down for a game where you're just, if you like Shadow of Mordor, like a lot, you're going to like Shadow of War equally because it's the same thing with a few new toys in to play with. The Nemesis system is there in, in, in completely intact with some new additions where like the captains can adapt mid fight to uh, your move. So if you keep doing like the double A move to jump over the captains and like attack them from behind, after you do that like three or four times, you try and do it, and then they just throw you off, and it says captains adapted to your techniques. And mm. if you so if you do a lot of the same thing over and over again, they can adapt. And there's a lot more captains in this game. I kept getting ambushed over and over by just different captains doing my mission. I'll just be fighting regular orcs, and all of a sudden I get tackled by a captain. He's like, this is because blah, 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 and I hate you, and you suck, and whatever. And it's like, oh, all right. And it just happens often. But he could have just stabbed you. He could have, but he right. tackled me, and he wanted you know an honorable. He duel, wanted I you guess. to know, okay, yeah. yeah. So I mean, that's and there's some cool things that can happen. There's some new little instances. Like I was fighting some guy, and I killed him. He was a captain, and his blood brother showed up as I murdered him, and was like enraged, like he was my blood brother, and now I'm gonna get vengeance on you. <laughs> this is and why started, I'm angry. Right, Here in my exposition. Cousin, twice removed. <laughs> yeah, and and there's some fun. There's some fun things to be had, obviously, with that and. Since there's a lot more captains, a lot of the time you'll be going to hunt a particular captain and there's another one nearby and he'll get involved in the fight. And uh, like, so that those kinds of like emergent gameplay moments are still there and they're better than they were in the first one, but it's still not, you know, hugely uh, different compared to the first game. And I haven't got to the loot box portion of the game yet. Apparently that's just the end. That's all we care about. We were waiting for that. (laughs) <laughs> Haven't gotten there yet, um, but uh, yeah, it's a lot of just like I, the amount of times I've killed somebody, and he's like, "He was my blood brother," and I'm like, "All right, well, this, you guys have lots of blood brothers. Mm. Like, it's kind of annoying." You gotta stop making more um, blood brothers, man. That's dangerous. But it's fun to like build your army and like send your captain to infiltrate another captain as his bodyguard, and then when you attack him, like he'll shank him in the back and be like, "Betrayal," because he works for you and doesn't work for him. Mm-hmm. You would think the giant blue hand on his face and his blue armor <laughs> that is not red like the rest would point out, but like. Why aren't you wearing the uniform there, Jimmy? He's like, we're on fashion choices. You Dude, know, like, no. if, if Tom Clancy can sit in the shadows with three glowing lights on his head, we just have to suspend all belief. <laughs> Tom at Clancy? This point. Tom Clancy? Yeah, he's, his name's Tom Clancy. Yeah, you know. <laughs> uh, but other than that, it's fun. It's just more powers. I mean, I'm 10 hours in and I've unlocked every single skill already. So oh, wow. I have all the skills. Hmm. And the gear, the gear doesn't matter. Like, every time you kill a captain, they'll drop you gear. 
but like you just it's one of those things where you don't really need to think about it. you just look at the gear and it's like does it give me green numbers or red numbers green numbers okay i put it on red numbers are right, uh, borderland school of thought Love yeah it. more or less more <laughs> or less and like the it doesn't make you look all that different it's, it's usually just a color swap mm. um and the story like listen if you're a lord of the rings like super nerd you should already know not to play this game because this is just shitting all over the Lord of the Rings lore oh, in every conceivable way. So don't play it if you're like, man, I wonder what happened before the Fellowship of the Ring. Was because... the first game guilty of that too? Oh, yeah. Yeah? 100%. People just kind of glossed over it because it was good enough? Yeah. like it. So the games take place before Fellowship of the Ring starts. So it's between The Hobbit and the Lord of the Rings trilogy. Mm. But it's like, it's not like they're... If, if Talion existed in this world, it'd be like Starkiller. If Starkiller was canon in the Star Wars universe, how the hell did Vader win anything? Starkiller could stop a ship, like a Star Destroyer, crashing into a planet with like his with the Force. I'm like, that's so fucking powerful. Talion's the same way. This dude is ripping through thousands of orcs in, an, in like two hours. How, how, did, how did he have an army by the end of any of this? Because he's just murdered everybody. I'm sure most people got that reference. I hope so. Star Killer that was a good game. It was a fun game. It was just, you know, Star Wars lore. Mm -hmm. Ignore it. I remember you said on Skype you thought it looked really bad. Yeah. So okay. I didn't think it, that. Would I be don't think it looks that good. It looks better because there is a an HD resolution texture pack. You actually have to download uh, separately on Steam, weird. which is really stupid. But yeah. even with the the texture pack, it yeah. still looks like a late last gen system game. To be fair, though, they probably did it separately so the game isn't. Wait, isn't it actually like 100 gigabytes? Yeah, I don't know. I, don't know. I was going to say so they could reduce the file size, but then I remembered it's actually the biggest game that's ever been released. Well, so maybe it was 150 before they did that, right? Okay. <laughs> could be. Sorry, go ahead. No, I'll just say it just looks like a late like 360 PS3 game still. So That sucks. It doesn't look, it doesn't look fantastic. It looks a lot like Shadow of Mordor. Did. That's two AAA games we've talked about today that have 360 graphics. That doesn't really bode well. <laughs> I, yeah, for what it's worth, I think Evil Within Look 2 looks a lot better than Shadow of War. Man. It's different moments look really good in, in Evil Within 2. Like in the setting up of the museum hotel area, there are areas in that that looked much more prepared to look pretty. Yeah. And like all the cloths have physics and everything has dynamic shadows and there's like moving light sources. It's just when you're in the open world area, it's like we've got to really dumb this down to make the frame rate not tank. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I also just That's played what. through a late era 360 game in the form of Fallout 3. So oh. I think that's like a damn. It's a damnation to suggest that Shadow Wait a of War was looks. Fallout 3 late 360? I guess, you know, it's like four years after the 360 launched. And what was the 10 so year So it wasn't even halfway through. Yeah, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Okay. But like, <laughs> I. I, did, I watched Rob play it, and I'll admit, like, I wasn't impressed with the way that it looked, but, like, late 360 is a little well, Shadow, bit of an exaggeration. Well, Shadow of Mordor was late 360, right? I'm not No, crazy. it was, like, a year after the PS4 came out. Oh, was it? Um, yeah. Well, then early PS4, then, is Because it? it looks exactly like Shadow of Mordor to me. Yeah. Like, it does not look any different visually. Mm. And that I guess it's because I was expecting a little bit more out of the game. Like, it's mindless. It's mm. mindless fun. Same engine, so, I'm sure, too, right? I'm, I'm assuming it must be. Yeah. yeah. Cool. All right. Well, there you go. Shadow of War just came out last week. It's 60 bucks, 80 bucks, or 100 bucks. Whatever you want it to be, really. <laughs> All right. Except for, you know, free. You can get the high res texture pack for free. Yeah. And the and 4K I cinematic pack. It. I don't know about that. <laughs> you don't think you need the 4K cinematic pack? I don't think you do, because this it's game like, is not about the cinematic cutscenes. So. I want to, like, get it for PS4. This is, like, the ultimate first-world problem, but I hate downloading things on the PS4. It just takes so long. Is, is it on <laughs> Wi-Fi? You could, like, physically go buy a CD. I could, yeah. I, I mean, I could, like, Amazon Prime it, I guess, but it's... I, I, I don't really want, like... We live in a small place. I don't want stuff. And then you, <laughs> down, you download anything over the age or over the size of, like... 40 gigs it's just a nightmare i don't know how big the ps4 version is it, but like i downloaded dragon age inquisition and it was like <laughs> probably like 14 hours or something like that mm -hmm. we're on fiber jesus man that's crazy i will say for shadow of war there's like a weird light pokemon element to it though which really? i enjoy 
because like you're, you're capturing these you're dominating these orcs and you know basically ens enslaving them to do your bidding and they all have their unique because they're all kind of randomly generated they all have their unique strengths and weaknesses and each area has a fighting pit and you can like pit like your orc versus like an enemy orc and if they win they get like they level up and they get some stuff if they lose well then you now can go dominate the guy who beat them if you want mm. um and you can do you don't get you don't you have no input. You just set up the fight, and then it's a two-minute fight if it lasts that long. And you just watch them just beat the hell out of each Dude, other. Dude, and, and I, then one remove the head of the other one. Or I now understand Rob's obsession with this. He's yeah, just watching AI orc fights all day, yeah, right? That's it. Gladiator <laughs> later is that it? It's like Madden, but you you know decapitate each other yeah, at the end. That's I yeah. mean that's really what he wanted Madden to be anyway. So he's finally yeah. got his answer. Yeah, that's that's why Rob likes it. I, I found some enjoyment in like pitting up uh, like pit fights for orcs to fight each other, but at the same time, like don't don't get too attached to your orcs because they're probably gonna die. Sweet. All right. Yeah. Shadow of War. It's available now. That's 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 gonna do it. Oh, I just saw an orc with no eyes. That was sad. Yeah. Yeah. Hey, everybody! Thanks for watching another episode of Roundtable Live. We appreciate your time. Thanks for joining us here on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast, uh, where we just crossed 20,000 followers, which is kind of neat. So thanks, guys, for following the channel here. Appreciate you. Uh, we are live every Friday at 3 p.m. Pacific here on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast. VOD uploaded the next day over on youtube.com slash bear taffy. You can follow our Twitter account at roundtable PC. And we also want to thank very much our Patreon supporters here on patreon.com slash roundtable, where you can throw the show a few bucks a month and keep us going. We really sincerely appreciate that support. I want to send a special shout out to Julian Avelsgard, Scrotting119, Ricky Grist, Jonathan Graham, Todd Buckley, Cowboy Chemist, Eric Schooley, famous electronic musician Stephen Aoki, Metadata Studios, James P., Peter Sinison, Ellis Spice, John Kalchik, O. Thomas Games BR, Jakar Sampson, Kulnar with a dance number, Sahoa, Joseph Boss, Penn Gillette, Michael Bush Larson, TJ Majesty, Talks to Wall, Chaos, Don't Tell Me You're Too Blind to See Theorist, Colby Klein, Greenlight, Oren Saltzman, Brizzlebrit, Positron, Mythscare, Mediocrities, Justin, Samurfet, Logan Ray. Thank you guys for elongating that list and uh, supporting us again over on patreon.com slash roundtable. Want to thank our Twitch subscribers well today. We appreciate your support here as well. That includes the list that is loading. Here it comes. Uh, subscriptions from Mildly Impolite and Niravro, Wootage, and Soapy Slaw. Thank you guys very much for the subscriptions here today on twitch.tv slash roundtable podcast. Thank you for watching. Uh, no show next week. I am away as uh, well as I think a couple of these guys are. I don't Oh, no, wait. No, you guys aren't going to TwitchCon, right? I am not going. Yeah. I'm going for the Sunday. You're going for the Sunday. That's right. So uh, I will be away and uh, we'll be back on the 27th for the next show. So we'll uh, see you here. October 27th for a new episode of Roundtable. Uh, Stole, thank you for the big cheer as well today, guys. Appreciate that. Uh, yeah, I appreciate that big one a lot. And uh, thank you very much for watching, everybody. We'll be back in a couple of weeks, and we'll see you then. Goodbye. Bye. Later.